Well, it's good to see you here today as we continue on in our sermon series, Saved to Serve. And today we're going to take a look at a section out of the first part of the Acts of the Apostles. But before we do that, let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for your presence here among us this day. We give you thanks for the Holy Spirit that you gave to us on this Pentecost to create the church, to give it birth, and to help to send us out into the world to serve you. We give you thanks that you're going to be with us here and speak to our hearts words of encouragement, to our minds words of faith. Speak into us that truth that is from you so that we might hear it by your spirit. We might believe it and we might sense Jesus present here this day. We ask these things in his holy name. Amen. So I was visiting in the hospital this week and as I was doing that, I was visiting a guy that he'd had surgery and I was sitting there talking to him about how things were going. And at one point he says to me, did you hear what happened to my wife? And I said, no, what, what happened to her? And, and she said, well, you know that, uh, that on cue down there at uh, 10th and Check Hall, anybody know where that's at? You know, that on cue down there at 10th and Check Hall, he says, uh, she was pulling in there, she pulled into one of the stalls there to get gas and on the next, one, next lane there, there was this woman. And apparently some or other, I don't know how, but he said her, she got her arm caught on fire and she would panicked out and she was waving her arm up in the air like that. And she said, and he says, that of course made it worse. And so my wife saw it and she jumped into our car and she grabbed this blanket and she went over there and she wrapped her arm with this blanket and she put out the fire. And it was just, it was just amazing. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. And at about that time, he said, the Yukon police pulled up and they arrested the woman. I said, what did they arrest her for? And he said, well, apparently in Yukon, it's illegal to wave a firearm. I can't help it. <laughs> so anyway, his wife, like the, bet, the kicker is, so his wife was sitting right there next to the bed, and she looks at me and she says, I can't believe you actually bought that. <laughs> no. okay, yeah. Well, uh, what I want to do today is I want to take a look at, really, I would say it was the greatest, I think one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. Uh, and you have to read four chapters, the first four chapters of the book of Acts in order to get the sense of it. Uh, and it starts with, uh, you know, Jesus teaching the apostles and, and his disciples there after the resurrection. And then he's ascended up into heaven. And then it's the day of Pentecost that happens and the response to Pentecost. And in those first four chapters of the book of Acts, we get a glimpse, a glimpse of what the kingdom of God is. You know, it says in the scripture that we're supposed to pray. Jesus teaches us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But what would that look like? You know, as I was thinking about that this week, I told my journey group uh, that I'm in, I said, uh, I was reminded of something that John Wesley said. John Wesley was the, the founder of the Methodist movement in the Church of England. And John Wesley said that when you see a, a newly converted Christian and they've decided they're going to give their life to Jesus and they're going to receive the forgiveness of God in their lives and they're going to receive the Holy Spirit in their life, he says, for just a time, a small time, what happens is that sin is, quote, stunned stunned in their lives it's incapacitated in their lives the old uh, the old dysfunctions the old habits the old mistakes they kind of fall away and he says and and there's such a there's such a glow about them as they as they have such a loving and forgiving and gracious and generous attitude towards other people and they're caring about other people and they want to talk about the lord and he says and then after that little time what happens is the old habits and dysfunctions and problems kind of kick in and through the power of the Holy Spirit, they have to wrestle with that as they move on towards the perfection that God wants for their lives. And I was thinking about that and I thought about this first four chapters of the book of Acts that starts with, like I said, with the ascension of the Lord and the giving of the Holy Spirit and what happens. And I thought to myself, that's what has happened with these at that point, uh, right after Jesus' resurrection, 120 people, this little community that through the resurrection and through the reception of the Holy Spirit, sin is stunned, it's incapacitated in that community. And you get to see a glimpse of what the kingdom of God is going to be like. You get to see it in, in the encouragement they gave for one another and the love and the fellowship that they had with one another and the way that they were constantly in worship and in the temple and in their homes and the way that they evangelized. And evangelism literally means, it comes from the Greek word euangelion, which means good news. They were sharing the good news with people and there was a, an incredible spiritual healing that was taking place amongst them. 
And just for a little bit, in those first four chapters, you get to see the kingdom of God. Just a little bit, a little glimpse. Now, the fifth chapter of things, the old things start to raise up their heads. But those first four chapters. Now, I'm going to invite you to go back and read those. Now, what I want to talk about is the third chapter. And in the third chapter, it says it's Pentecost has happened. The church has been formed. It's been empowered. And the next day it says there, there, that uh, there's this guy, uh, and this guy is about 40-some years old, and he is a lame man, and he's got some kind of problems with his ankles and with his feet, and he is being carried by people into the temple to be laid at the beautiful gate there in the temple of God, right there at the entrance to beg for money. And if you'll notice, it says people. It doesn't say his family. Because my guess is that what happened is his, you know, his family may have disowned him and said, hey, you're on your own. Uh, we can't support you. Get out there in the streets and beg. And that's where you're going to die. And there's a kind of almost a, I guess I call it a cloud of discouragement that hangs over those first few words as you think about what he must have thought about his life. I must have thought, gee, uh, you know, uh, I'm always going to be like this. It's never going to get any better. I'm never going to have good health. I'm never going to walk. It's always been this way. It always will be this way. I'm just going to get by at best by begging. I'm going to be just a beggar out here on the street until I die. That, that was probably what he thought. And there were undoubtedly, uh, you know, times when it was just kind of like, it was terrible, a terrible burden for him. That discouragement that was upon him. Now, you know, I just, I thought to myself, this is, that's, Sometimes what happens with us? We get that kind of cloud of discouragement over us and we think things are never going to change. Things are never going to get better. It's always going to be this way. I'm never going to. I'm never going to get well. I'm never going to get past this addiction. I'm never going to get past this problem. I'm never going to find that right person. I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to have children. I'm never going to get that job that I need. And we just like load ourselves down in that discouragement, and we walk around with that cloud over us. And then we find the, well, I call them the prophets of discouragement, who come to us and they tell us, wow, you're right. I mean, can't you imagine that guy, he's laying there, and there are people coming over to him and saying, oh, you poor, sad person, you're always going to be like that, pat him on the head, and you're never going to get any better, and that's the way it's always going to be with your life, you're going to die here. Those prophets of discouragement. Have you ever, you ever had a prophet of discouragement in your life? Yeah, I see some of you nodding. You know, uh, as I was thinking about that this week, I was reminded of something that happened to me years ago when I was ministering down in the little town of Hebrew out in southeastern Oklahoma. And uh, it's always interesting as a pastor to go into a church because the church will tell you what the Holy Spirit has been telling them they ought to be doing. And then they'll, a lot of times, they're like, well, I don't know if we can do that. And uh, what the Holy Spirit had been telling those people was, Man, there's some problems with housing in this town, and somebody needs to do something about it. And, you know, it was made worse because there is this corporation, this big corporation put this giant chicken processing plant on the north side of town that employed 2,600 people. And, heck, there was only about 1,800 people in the town, so you could imagine the kind of problems in housing they would have. I mean, people were being ripped off right and left. And they would keep saying, somebody ought to do something about that. And I said, well, why don't we do something about it? Well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, why don't we start a kind of a Habitat for Humanity style housing project here. We'll call it the Hevener Housing Mission. And we'll gather up the money and, and we'll gather up the talent and the volunteers and, and we'll build houses for people that we've screened and, and they can put their sweat equity in it and what have you. And, well, okay, I, we could try that. And so. It's apparently in the community there were the prophets of discouragement that were saying, that can never happen. There's only 70 people or 75 people going to that church on Sunday morning. They can never be building houses. They just can't do it. It can't happen. And then the money got raised, and the volunteers showed up, and the people with the technical ability that we needed a volunteer, a plumber said, I'll do the plumbing, and an AC and heating guy said, I'll do the AC and heating, and an electrician said, I'll do the electrical work, and the next thing you know, the, somebody comes along and says, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll just give you a plot. I'll give you a plot of land there, uh, a lot that you can use. 
and the goal was we'll build a house for about, we got, I think it was like $21,525 or something like that. We built a house. And these people, this Hispanic family with three little kids helped us. And they were putting in their sweat equity. And the house started. And I was up at uh, somebody's home and uh, visiting with them. And this guy comes to me and he says, he starts laughing. He says, you won't, I tell you what, Pastor, there are a lot of people in this town that's going to have to eat their words. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said, that'll never happen. It's not possible. It can't happen. And I guess it is. Because what people think can't happen, God knows can happen. What people think can't happen, God knows can happen. And so here is this guy. He'd been listening to the prophets of discouragement. And he'd been prophesying to himself. But, I, you know, I, I was reading this story and I thought to myself, wait a second, there's something strange here. Because here's this guy and he could be asked to play, be placed any place in Jerusalem by these people. And where he wanted to be placed was in the beautiful gate there at the temple of God. That's where he wanted to lay. Now, and I thought, well, maybe he went there because, because that's where he thought he could get more money. And then I thought, maybe he went there because there was just a little seed of hope in him. A little seed that said, I want to get well. I want to get well. And I want you to take me and put me in the beautiful gate there at the house of God because I think I might have a chance to get well. Maybe God could bless me there. And so there he'd laid morning after morning and one morning, uh, or one afternoon, at 3 o'clock, it says, Peter and John walk into the temple. And they maybe hear him yelling out, help the poor lame man, give him some alms. Help the poor lame man, give me some alms. And they see him, and who do they see? Do they see a guy and they think, boy, that guy, he's pretty pathetic, isn't he? There's nothing that's going to be done for him. He's always going to be that way. He's always going to be laying there. He'll lay there until he dies, and they carry him out and dump him somewhere. No. <laughs> what they saw was a son of the Lord. A son of the Lord who was beaten down. A son of the Lord stuck in his discouragement. And they went over to him. And what had happened was this guy who only wanted a couple of pennies. That's all his discouraged mind could think of. A couple of pennies. He received vastly more. Because what money could not do, the name of Jesus did. And he got up and he walked into the temple with them. And it says he was leaping and he was joy-filled, and he was praising God, and he was thanking God there in the temple of God. And he, at the beautiful gate, well, God took his pain and made it something beautiful. And God made him a sign, a sign that God is greater than our problems. God is greater than our problems. And so there he is, he's leaping and jumping around in the temple and people see him and they think, isn't that that guy that used to lay out there at the temple, at the beautiful gate? What's he doing jumping around? He shouldn't be able to do that. And so they go over and they kind of swarm around him and they're trying to figure out what's going on and they look at him, they can't really believe it. And Peter steps up and he's going to explain to them what's happened. And he says to them, well, first he says to them words of humility. He says to them, I need for you to understand, we didn't do this. We don't have the power to do this. That God is lifting up the name of Jesus, and that's how this man is healed. And then he gets honest with them. And he says to them, and you rejected Jesus. And you ran him down to the local Roman governor, and you got him executed. And in exchange for Jesus, what you took was a murderer by the name of Barabbas. 
and then he gives them a word of healing. And he says to them this, friends, I know you did that in ignorance. Just like your rulers did it in ignorance too. And you know, when, when I read that, I think to myself, that's us. I mean, how many times in our lives do we do things, well, because we don't know what we're doing or we don't understand or we've got misconceptions and, and we're thinking to ourselves, well, I got to do this and we do stuff and it, it, it's the wrong thing. And then we think to ourselves, if only, if only I would have never said that. If only I'd have never done that. If only I'd have never thought that. You ever done that in your life? And then we think to ourselves, if I'd have known then what I know now, I would have never. These people are just like us. And then he gives them word of hope. He says, now it's time to let all that stuff go. And it's time to turn to the Lord. And if we do, what he'll do is he'll, he'll wipe the slate clean. And just like this man this morning who has been healed, he says, and who has received a time of refreshing in his life, so it will be with you. You will receive a time of refreshing that God wants to give to you. And not only that, but this man's healing is just a, it's just a little glimpse of the universal restoration that's coming. You can think of his healing, you can think of what you see this day as just a glimpse of, of your future. When God will restore all things and you will live in the kingdom. And so he was offering them the opportunity to get past the discouragement and past the prophecies that they had been taking inside of themselves, that things are never going to get better in my life. They're always going to be that way. And say, no, wait a second. God values you. And God has something better for you. And one day, you will live in the kingdom of God. This day, is it a day to let go of discouragement? This day, is it a day to let go of the past? Is it a day to start new attitudes? Is it a day to receive a time of refreshing from God in your life? Is it a day to sense that there's a restoration that's coming for you? This day, is it time to receive the hope that God offers us all? Let's pray. We praise you, Lord. We give you thanks that in our discouragement, in our limited thinking that we have in our minds, that you can push through it all and that you want to work, speak a word of hope into our lives and speak faith into us this day. Help us this day to let go of that old discouragement and all that old negativity and to reject the prophets of discouragement and to listen to you. Help us to sense that there is a time of refreshing for our lives. There is a time when you wipe the slate clean. We give you thanks that restoration is our future. Help us this day to glimpse it, to take hold of it, and to start to live it in you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.